Hello and welcome to this series on running virtual choir projects. This is a three part series and in this first video I'm going to look at how I prep for running a virtual choir project. The first video will look at kind of stage one of the process and in that stage I'll, I'll be deciding my piece that I'm going to do with my choir, I'll be creating rehearsal tracks and guide tracks for the virtual choir project. Now I go one stage further, I also create guide videos of me conducting, but that is an additional um, option that you don't actually have to do. In order to run your own projects, you will however need to record your own rehearsal tracks for your members to practice against, and guide tracks for the actual project that they will use when they submit their recordings. The first part of this video will conclude by my explaining how I teach my choir members what they will need to do their end in order to create a submission to send to me. And then I will finish the video by showing you the type of invite that I send out to my members. In the second video in this series, um, I'll look at part two of the process, which is the editing of the audio that my members send in to me. Um, in that I will be resynchronizing the audio that they send me, adding a bit of reverb and tidying it up or mastering it. It's important to realize that for the best results you want to try to edit the audio and the video separately and then merge them back together. It's far better to do that than try to do it all in your video editor. And in the third and final video of this series, I shall explain my methods of editing the video and resynchronizing the mastered sound from part two. So it's a three part video series. Uh, for people starting out, I want to emphasize that this is quite an arduous project to run. And it's technically demanding on both your technical skills and your actual computer system. You'll need quite a powerful computer to be able to run such a project. If you want an easier option, I would suggest abandoning the idea of using video and just aim for producing a finished audio product. So in other words, just an audio file. Uh, there is a far, this is far easier, less technical and less demanding on both your skill and your computer. Um, even if you produce just an audio finished product, you could still add photos to it to create stills or like a, a collage or whatever to upload onto servers like um, or services like YouTube. If you are desperate to create a proper video like the ones you've probably seen online but are worried about your skills or your time, um, I will suggest a workaround in part three of this series, so you have to wait for that. Before getting part one underway, um, you'll note that throughout this series, I use two packages exclusively. Now I'm a Mac based musician, so all of my software is on Mac. And the two packages you'll see me using are Logic Pro 10 and Final Cut Pro 10 as well. If you are a PC, a PC user or you don't want to fork out on these very expensive packages because they are significantly expensive, there are alternatives, that, software that you could use and I will kind of allude to those throughout the video. Um, for audio editing, there is the free package called Audacity which can be used on uh, both Mac and PC. For video, DaVinci is one uh, video editing package that's also free, just the name one. Um, all packages will work slightly differently and may require you to use or find additional tutorials online to help you navigate your way around them. Um, given what I've said above about creating just an audio version of a virtual choir project, in the second video in this series where I go into my workflow of editing the audio, um, I'm going to show you how to do it or how I do it, my workflow in Logic Pro 10 because of course that's the system that I use. But I'll also show you a similar, how similar results can be obtained by using the free package Audacity. So you may want to use that if you're not a Mac user. Uh, before we get underway, there's one final thing I need to address and that is um, the consideration of the legal side of doing this. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, you've got to be very careful with copyright and uh, licensing. Um, in the UK, there is a society called Making Music that has some useful advice on this. Essentially, if the music is in the public domain, you've got nothing to worry about. But if the music is in copyright, um, you're going to need some type of license in order to make and distribute your tracks. Uh, that's your rehearsal tracks, your virtual choir project tracks, and obviously your finished result as well. 
Now, just taking some information from their website, the Making Music website, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Facebook have blanket licenses, uh, license agreements with all of the major international um, recording uh, labels and publishing houses, meaning that users of these websites can safely assume that recordings that they upload to them are going to be covered. Um, this includes posting a video on YouTube, for example, but then embedding the link in your own choir's website, which is what I do. Um, reading from Making Music, there are benefits to share your recordings this way rather than trying to host your recordings directly on your own site. And the benefits that Making Music list are as follows. It is the easiest and cheapest way to use music online. Platforms like Facebook do all the licensing for you so you don't need to worry about it. Um, second, you can embed the videos and recordings from third-party sites on your own site and still be covered by those blanket licenses. As I say, that's exactly what I do. Your recordings, if you upload them to, say, YouTube, are publicly av available and accessible, so that makes it easier for your members to access. And if you want those recordings to be private, uh, most of these sites, like YouTube, for example, you can set them privately so only people with the actual link can view those videos, and yet they're still covered by those licenses that YouTube and those sites have. Um, your recordings obviously can be easily si uh, shared um, on social media if they're uploaded to those platforms. And finally, you can create playlists, and I'll be talking about that later in this video. If you do want to host it on your own site, say, for example, a piece of copyright mu music that you've created a rehearsal track for, you're likely to need a limited online music license. Um, certainly in the UK, they last for a year. They cost around about £138 plus VAT, and you'll need to obviously research that yourself. Um, in terms of the question of could you create a track and send it to your members via something like Dropbox or via email, this is a bit of a grey area. Um, if they're being sent directly to the, uh, an individual, you might be okay, but it's a bit of a grey area. I would um, heed the, the advice of making music and do all of your tracks, post them on YouTube or some similar service so you know that you're covered. Um, right. Let's look at the first stage of the virtual choir project. Obviously, you'll need to decide on the piece that you're going to do with your choir. One thing to think about is that your members are going to need to have a score. Licenses do not cover members to learn a piece of music by rote without a score. So if you created a rehearsal track um, from a score, let's say, and you posted that to your members and they learnt the piece by rote, that, I'm afraid, would still be illegal and would be breaking copyright law. Um, so in those circumstances can they be learning it by rote. They will need their own scores. Your singers will be able to get a score from a publishing house such as um, Sheet Music Direct. Um, they can pay for it there and they can download it and print it themselves. So particularly in current circumstances with the lockdown, it's far easier for them to be buying it and printing it themselves. For the project that I'm going to be describing in this series, um, I will be using one of my own arrangements. It's an arrangement that I made of Bob Dylan's Make You Feel My Love, which I published on Sheet Music Plus. So I direct my choir members to that page um, on Sheet Music Plus and they purchase the arrangement there. They print it themselves, ready to use the guide tracks that I'll be creating as for part of the virtual choir project. So now that I've decided on the piece, let's look at how I create my rehearsal tracks and virtual choir guide tracks. This is Logic Pro 10, the package that I use, my DAW. Now, of course, you might be using something like GarageBand or you may be using the free package Audacity. They all work in a very similar way. And what I'm doing in Logic here, uh, certainly at this stage, you'll be able to do in the free package Audacity as well. Now this is one I've made earlier. This is, this is the project of the rehearsal tracks that I made a couple of weeks ago, but I'll take you through how I created uh, the four rehearsal tracks. At the top of the screen on track one is the piano part to make you feel my love. Then underneath that we have track two, the soprano part, the alto, the tenor and the bass. So the first thing I needed to do is record the piano part. I could have done that myself. Uh, I chose not to on this occasion. I chose to ask the accompanist of the choir that I'm working with, that's Johnny Lane, to record the piano part for me. He already had a copy of the score, so he was able at home to record the piano part and send it to me. So I've imported it here uh, onto track one. Let's have a quick listen to just the introduction. OK, 
okay. So that's the piano part. Now, in when I record it myself, there's a couple of ways of recording into a DAW. You could record via audio. So that would be taking either an audio out if you've got a digital concert piano um, or a clavinova as I have, uh, and taking that straight into your computer and recording the audio. Another alternative is to take the MIDI out of your keyboard, again, assuming it's a, a digital keyboard, and taking that into your DAW. The beauty of that that I find is I'm prone to make mistakes when I'm recording. So if the MIDI signals that I'm dealing with in the in Logic, for example, I can edit out those mistakes and correct them. And it saves me having to waste time repeatedly recording something until it's perfect. If you're recording audio, of course, you don't have that luxury. You've got to do it in one take. So that's a couple of ways of recording the piano part. After I've done that, I set up a second track label it soprano. I have my mic attached to my computer and usually at this stage I call Chloe in and, and with, with a copy a co of the score I ask her to sing against the piano part. So wearing headphones, standing in front of the microphone, she can hear the piano part through the headphones and using her score she can sing the soprano part. So let's hear the opening of the soprano part. Okay, so that's the soprano part. She also recorded the alto part that you can see starts at the same time. I then went in and recorded the tenor and bass part. So you can see the tenor part comes in here and the bass part is in here as well. Now, when you've got all of them in your DAW, if I just, just add a little bit of the, uh, what I'm doing here is just panning them slightly so they're not all sitting in the center of the stereo image and I'll unmute them all so you can hear all four. It allows us to play all four together. Press play. I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue. So that's just the four parts being played together there. Now you can mix that down or bounce that down as the term is in Logic um, as all four parts playing and it creates quite a nice performance track which can be a nice guide to your choir to show them the final result. What you will need to do, or certainly what I do, is I mute all but one of the tracks so that way I can make a recording of just the soprano part and the piano part. Now I found over the years of doing this that my choir like to have their tracks introduced so I put a little introduction at the very start of uh, the project, as you can see, there's one on each track that sounds something like this. If I play you the soprano one, make you feel my love, soprano part. So that way, if they're listening in their cars or whatever, um, they can uh, tell what the track is straight away. I then set the starting point and the end point of the project, making sure I've only got the piano and the soprano part unmuted, so everything else is muted and I bounce it down. So I go to export or bounce, project selection, and then that allows me to mix that down onto basically one single MP3. So there we go, then I'll bounce it. I'm not gonna do that now because I've already done this. Right, so that's the first part. Obviously you'd have to then do that with the, soprano, the alto, the tenor, and the bass. When you have those four tracks, you might be encountering a bit of a problem because YouTube will not accept just an MP3, it only accepts videos. And you remember in the legal section, I said that it's a good idea to upload these to a service like YouTube, so you're covered by their blanket licensing. Um, so what I usually uh, do at this stage is I load that MP3, let's say the Soprano MP3, into something like iMovie, or in my case, Final Cut Pro, which is a video editing package, and I create a simple video. I just put a title on it, such as Make You Feel My Love, arranged by Guy Bunce um, for this choir, uh, music and lyrics by Bob Dylan. Then when I created that video, I upload that onto YouTube. And that way their licensing will cover the, the licensing issue. Uh, you can on YouTube set it as a unlisted video. And what that means is only people with the link to that video will be able to access it. It won't come up as a general on a general search. So if someone went onto YouTube and searched for that particular video, it wouldn't show. Only people with the actual link. And that's quite useful if you want to keep it quite private. 
Um, so that's the first stage, creating the video, sorry, the video of the rehearsal track for your members to be then to the learn their part. Particularly useful if your members are non-music readers um, and they, they need that extra help. We're back in Logic Pro 10 for the second part. Now we need to create the virtual choir guide track for Make You Feel My Love, one per voice type. So the basis of this is the rehearsal track that I've just created. First thing I will need to do after I've created those rehearsal tracks is put some type of introduction to say what this guide track is going to be. So this is what I've recorded. You can see I've got the tracks up again, very similar to before, soprano, alto, tenor and bass. Let's hear what I've said for the new introduction. So this is the introduction to the soprano guide track for the virtual choir. Soprano parts to virtual choir project Make You Feel My Love. Now on the alto one, I've obviously got one that says alto. Following that, there is a long spiel that I do explaining what they are going to need to do. So let's have a quick listen to that. Please make sure you have watched the instruction video before recording your entry. Use this track to practice your part. If you are recording your entry, you must wear headphones. Set your recording device up as instructed in the instruction video. If you're using a tablet or a phone, please record in a portrait orientation and set it recording now. You are here four clicks. Please clap on clicks three and four. There will then be a short pause before the accompaniment starts and you can sing. Okay, so we need to explain a couple of things about that. You'll notice I keep alluding to an instruction video. So I created a guide video. Now you can see this on my YouTube channel. I'll try to link it in the description here as well. I suggest you watch that. That video I created before I ran the first project that showed my members how to uh, run, how to create their own videos to send me. It also explained how they would submit their videos after they'd created them. So that's what I'm referring to in that little introduction there. You'll also hopefully have heard that I asked my members to start recording if they're going to use this to rehearse. Obviously, they would just rehearse. But if they're actually going to be making their submission, they start recording using their video about here. And then the video tells them or that this, this uh, instruction tells them to listen out for the four clicks, but to clap on three and four. So they'll do something like this. Now, of course, because their device is recording, that's going to come out on their recording. And I can use those claps to synchronize their videos when and their audio when they send it in to me with all of the other audio and video that I receive. Though I use those, those two claps that they do to synchronize, and you'll see that in the second part to this series. Now I've got that recorded once. I don't like to repeat myself, so I will copy that down onto the other track. So when I make the alto track, I've got it set up there. It's muted at the moment. So I'll do it onto the tenor part, and I'm using a very quick method in uh, Logic of copying and pasting by holding the Alt key. Um, you can obviously use uh, copy and paste in the usual fashion as well if you don't know the shortcuts. So I now have an introduction to each voice part. Let's just have a listen to what the tenor part sounds like. Tenor part, the virtual choir project make you feel my love. Please make sure... Now, of course, these instructions are exactly the same, so I've just posted them. I copied and pasted them. Now comes the important part. Over here, what we have is that rehearsal track that I created previously. I've imported it into this project, and I've put it on the appropriate track. So that's the soprano part that we recorded. That's the alto part. That's the tenor part and that's the bass part. Now it's absolutely crucial at this stage that these line up because remember your synchronization point will be these two claps that your singers will be uh, doing uh, on their recording. So it's really important that everything else lines up after that. So you can see if we just play the soprano part from here, you'll see when it gets over here that's that mixed down, that bounce down rehearsal track. There's a gap. That's 
Johnny playing the introduction, and then somewhere around here is just the piano part and the soprano part that Chloe recorded. So the soprano obviously doesn't sing in this section. Okay, so that would then allow me to uh, create the guide track for the Sopranos. At the very end, I tend to put something like this. Let me just show you. Uh, right at the very end, where is it? Here we go. I put this kind of coda. Do not stop the recording yet. Continue looking into the camera. And you can move and stop the recording now. That's quite important because if I'm going to do a video at the end, I might want to fade it. And the last thing I want is my singer to finish singing and just reach into the camera and turn their device off because it will look messy. So that little instruction at the end there tells my singers to stand absolutely still, carry on looking into the camera so that I've got time to fade them out. Uh, I'm a, just like I did before, I'm going to copy that onto all tracks. So let's put that down there and you can see everything's lining up nicely. And just going back to the beginning again, notice the gap here as well. The gap between the last clap that they're going to do and where the song starts. That again, just like the ending, gives me a chance to fade up the video. If I put the music right on top of the last clap, it means that we might even see that clap in the video, um, the final video, which I don't want. So now I have those tracks made, I've got the little int the introduction announcing what track it is the instructions with the claps on it, and then perfectly lined up the four rehearsal tracks. I need to select the beginning, and I'll select the end. Here we go, where's the end? After the outro or coda, I'll make sure that I've got everything muted apart from my soprano, and I will mix or bounce that down. So it will work like that. Soprano parts to virtual choir project Make You Feel My Love. It then has Please. the instructions, the claps, the backing track, and the outro instructions. I'll then do exactly the same as I did before, mix that down or bounce it down. This time I will call it virtual choir guide track. I'll then do the same with the outro. Alto parts to virtual choir project Make You Feel My Love. Please make sure you have watched the instruction. Okay, and then I'll do the same mixing that down, bouncing that down, do the same with the tenor, and do the same with the bass. After I have those four MP3s, I'll need to create simple videos again to load, upload to YouTube, and that way my members will have those guide tracks that they can use for their final recordings. Now that I've recorded the rehearsal tracks, the four rehearsal tracks that became the basis for the four guide tracks, I go one stage further, as well as uploading those simple videos that just have the title of the piece to YouTube, I also create conducted videos. Now this is not necessary, but I know that my members often like to see me on screen conducting them so I can give them the cues and also the cutoffs at the end of phrases. The way I do this is really simple. I set up my video camera over there near the books, I play the guide track that I've created, say for example the soprano guide track and I conduct to it, and then I merge the two, the original guide track and the video of my video camera in Final Cut Pro. Now, as I say, this is not necessary. You don't have to do this. As long as they have the guide track, the conducted video is an added bonus. But let's have a look at what it looks like. Now I'm on YouTube, and this is the guide track, the conducted guide track that I've created for the soprano part to make you feel my love. You might recognize the audio because it's exactly the same. Soprano part to virtual choir project make you feel my love. Please make sure you have watched the instruction video. So that audio is gonna be exactly the same because that's what I've merged. If I go in here and bring myself back into the room, here we go. So I can then conduct the choir using uh, my usual gestures that they'll be used to. Now, as I say, that is um, an added extra that you could do if you so choose. Before you can launch your project, you're going to need to decide how your members are going to get their videos to you. 
One of the issues with videos is they tend to be large files and are difficult to attach to email. Some providers will actually allow you to attach larger files um, by sending them online, but um, often you'll find that they will just say the file size is too large. You could try using WhatsApp. I've had quite a lot of success with members sending me files through WhatsApp, or there is also a service called You Send It, which allows you to send large files online. What I use mainly is Dropbox, because I have a paid Dropbox account, and they have a file request system that's just come into Dropbox now. It's quite a new feature that allows me to send a link out to my members requesting files. Then from their device, their tablet, their phone, or their computer, they can send their video to that link, and it appears on my machine. Now, of course, when you have all of this in place, you have your guide tracks on YouTube, let's say, like I have, maybe you're conducting videos, you, uh, your members have bought their scores and you've decided a retrieval method that they're going to be able to send their videos to you. When you have that all in place, you're going to want to send an invite to your members. Now, with the choirs that I'm involved in, we use MailChimp to run our newsletters. We send out weekly newsletters through MailChimp. MailChimp is a free service, or certainly we use the free side of it, that allows us to send out a bulk email to all our members. Uh, one of the choirs, for example, is 150 members, so it makes it really easy to be able to message um, all of those members at once. If I show you the invite that I have sent out for the Make You Feel My Love project that went out the other day, nice photo at the top, then the information on the invite. There is also a video of our previous virtual choir project, that's also on my YouTube channel. And then a bit of information to remind members about how they're going to need to run their virtual choir videos and how they're going to organize them their end and send them to me, record them and send them to me. And here is a link to the video that I created, the instruction video that I mentioned earlier. Please also have a look at that, take a look at that because that might give you an idea on the type of things you're going to need to tell your members. Um, underneath we have some links. There is a link to Sheet Music uh, Direct or Sheet Music Plus where my score is that the members can purchase. There is a reminder up here that if they download the PDF, if they purchase the PDF, they shouldn't distribute it outside the choir um, because obviously they need to pay for it. Uh, virtual choir music tracks, there's a link to the tracks um, and on YouTube and there's also a link to the virtual choir conducting videos that I created. Um, there is uh, my email address so people can uh, ask any questions that they have. And finally, there is a button. If, it, if I click that, it will take them through to that Dropbox screen that I show them in the instruction video and then allow them to submit their video. Finally, there is the deadline. I've set it for the end of this month. Something I would advise is if you run more than one project at the same time, Obviously, try not to have your deadlines all at the same time because you'll be inundated with videos and it can be quite stressful. So I've staggered the, uh, the deadlines that I have across my four choirs. So essentially, that's the end of this video. I hope that's been of use to you. And I would invite you, uh, before you go too much further, do check out my video of, of instructions that I send my members that's in the description and I've alluded to a couple of times in this video because it will give you an idea on the type of things you're going to have to tell your members. Very soon I'll be creating part two which will show you how I edit the audio and then part three which will show you how I edit the video. For now, hope you're all well. Take care.